there's a great treasury of stories in the Scripture. Stories about how God has intervened, as we pray He does. How God has guided, how God has empowered, how God has nurtured. Remember last week, there was an incredible story about how God came to a 75-year-old whose name was Abram, promises him a, a family, promises him land for that family to live in, and an amazing display of faith and trust. Abram leaves the place where he was familiar to go to a place that he had no idea where God was leading him. And then when he gets to the promised land, God speaks to him and says, again, I'm confirming that I will give you a son and that this is the land where that son and his family shall live. And Abraham builds an altar there. And then when Abram is in his fourth quarter, God comes to him and comes through on that promise and he gives him the son, Isaac. And then in a real twist to the plot, God will command Abram some years later to build a final altar and to sacrifice that teenage son on that altar. And Abram's clueless about why God would ask such a thing or how all of that's going to turn out. But in full trust, he knows that God knows what he's doing even if Abram does not know what he's doing. And so he dramatically, and he's going to go through with this. And God stops him just at the last moment providing a ram in the thicket to say, that's the sacrifice that you will place on that altar instead of your son. It's a, a dramatic story. It's a glorious story of faith and of trusting in the mystery of God. And it also provides the backstory to help us better understand a sacrifice that's going to happen on that same location centuries later as God the Father would sacrifice His own Son for you and for me. Now we believe that God... He's not done crafting great stories. God's still in the business of creating great lives, great churches that will have great stories. And so now this is our turn. It's our time. It's our generation uh, in which to allow God to craft a great story in us and through us. It's our generation to, to know and love God, to know and love people and to bring the two together through Jesus Christ. And so... The life of Jesus Christ is without question in all of Scripture and in all of hu human history the most epic life that has ever been lived. But in my opinion, the second greatest, most epic life ever lived is that of King David. It's my opinion. I mean, in terms of sheer volume, his story fills more pages of your Bible than anyone else's story. Anyone's. His name occurs more in your Bible than anyone else's name. Anyone's. A fellow Presbyterian pastor who's now gone on to the church triumphant, whose name is Eugene Peterson, in his off time, he wrote a paraphrase of the entire Bible. It's called The Message. And Eugene Peterson says, We know more about David than any other person in all of Scripture. His story is the most complete, detailed rendering of a God-dimensioned humanity that we have. I mean, the sheer expanse of this man's skill set is stunning, breathtaking. He's a world-class musician. He's a world-class songwriter. We're still singing his songs today. He's a world-class politician, world-class nation builder, whose nation is still around today. He is a world-class warrior. He's the only person in all of Scripture that is described as a man after God's own heart. Now, in David's early life, his character, it was astonishing. And his ideals, stratospheric. Uh, his personality was so charismatic, his dynamism so magnetic that all kinds of people were drawn into his, his relational circle. Uh, whether they were princes or paupers, whether they were lawbreakers or lawmakers, whether they were the cultured or barbaric, poets and prophets, the ruthless and the religious, they were all swept into David's relational circle. Before his 30th birthday, David had already encountered uh, the most dynamic, the most magnetic, the most attractive people in his entire nation, but he'd never met someone who had encompassed all of those qualities until he met a woman named Abigail. Now, there's a backstory behind David's meeting Abigail. Years before they met, we all know the story of David. He faces Goliath. He defeats Goliath and he vaults into national hero status 
and that makes the current king, Saul, jealous. Saul puts a contract out on David's life, and for the next 15 years, David's on the run as a fugitive in his own country. And even in the tightening vice grip of life-threatening pressure, David maintains his ideals that he had since he was young. He maintains those ideals. I mean, just as an example, uh, just before David meets Abigail, in, it's recorded in 1 Samuel 25. In 1 Samuel 24, David and his men again are running uh, for their lives from King Saul. Uh, they're in the back of a cave hiding. And the king comes in not knowing that they are there. He comes in to relieve himself. Again, if I was a junior high, if I channel my junior high boy, I could talk a lot more about that. I'm not going to. He comes in to relieve himself, and then he decides, in the cool of this cave, I'm going to take a nap. So as he begins his kingly snoring, David's men are say to him, this is unbelievable. God, in all of his sovereignty, has orchestrated this opportunity for you to take care of the problem. Just kill the king. He'll provide no resistance. He's sleeping. In a near superhuman display of divine-like mercy and self-discipline, David whispers to his men, no one touches the king. He's not acting much like it, but he is a God-ordained king. No one touches him. So, if killing Goliath took epic courage, not killing King Saul took epic integrity that was based on David's ideals that he held ever since he was young. Now, the temptation to compromise those ideals uh, became very intense. And actually, you've been there, uh, especially if you've got a few miles on your odometer, especially if maybe you're in the fourth quarter. You, you remember, you, you once had ideals that were crystal clear, ideals that were passionately held uh, in your earlier years, but they have gotten fuzzy, and they become the, the victim to expediency. And a lot of those ideals that were on the front burner in your youth, uh, they've been kind of backburnered, if they're on the stove at all. They got crushed in the cynical world. David, he got virtually no support to maintain his ideals, other than two individuals. One of them was Jonathan, his best friend, but another one was his spiritual mentor, the, the number one prophet in the land whose name was Samuel. Uh, circumstances did not allow David and Samuel to get together very often, but just simply knowing that Samuel was there praying for David, it gave David kind of a moral grounding and a support. But then as chapter 25 begins, where David will meet uh, Abigail, it begins with two verses that said John, uh, Samuel passed away from old age. And David's soul, it just begins to crack under the pressure he's under. And, and it would be a, a chapter with a narrative where David would lose it entirely and abandon all of his ideals if it wasn't for a woman named Abigail. Now, Abigail, she's probably a trophy wife, but she's got a whole lot under the hood. It ain't just good looks. Her husband is wealthy. He's got multiple flocks. And David, still possessing kind of an ideal uh, from his shepherd days, he knows that the sheep... Uh, of even another man, they're still vulnerable, vulnerable to attacks from predators uh, and attacks from poachers. And so David takes it on himself to just protect these, these flock of this man, Abigail's husband. But come sheep shearing time, David sends a group of his men to seek kind of a gratuity for protecting the sheep. See, it was customary in those days. It would be like a, a waiter or a waitress who has served you very well uh, well, they're kind of expecting kind of a gratuity uh, at the end of your uh, culinary stay. The same thing is true with David. So he sends this group to Nabal, Abigail's husband. And Nabal is not described in a very good light in the Scripture. He's rough, he's crude, he's selfish, and he insults David men, and he sends them away empty-handed. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. You... you I don't know you would die. Get out of my face. So they go back and they report it all to David. 
And David flies into a rage. He has a Jekyll and Hyde kind of a transformation. And he goes from being a gracious king sparer, where he spared the king in that cave just the previous chapter. Now he's a pistol-packing warlord, and he's, gonna, he's intent on slaughtering every male that's associated with Nabal. Everyone. So he spares a king who is trying to kill him, but now David's ready to kill somebody who just offended him. So word gets back to Abigail uh, of her husband's unnecessary offensiveness and of the potential bloodbath that might ensue because David is a warrior. She wisely, she accurately assesses the danger that her husband has placed her family in And she takes it on herself to head out into David's direction. Uh, She is going to intercept them on the road, having uh, gotten all of the supplies of food that they had on hand, which was quite a bit. And she intercepts them on the road, and there they meet for the first time, David and Abigail. One lone woman uh, is facing a small army uh, army of deeply offended testosterone-laden, angry young men. And she is only armed with her beauty, her intelligence, her poise, her courage, and all of these provisions that she's brought. Weaponless in a sword-swinging world, Abigail disarms David. I mean, quite literally. I mean, the magnitude of her risk and her courage, they're not lost on David. Nor is her beauty. She's got jaw-dropping beauty in a smoking hot package. So she's got David's attention. And, but she also possessed an emotional intelligence and a brilliant intellect. And the wisdom that begins to pour forth from her mouth stops David in his tracks. Her words flow majestically. And as she appeals to the better angels of David's nature, she's pe- appealing for him to hold on to his highest ideals. She freely acknowledges, you know what, my husband has treated you callously and he was abrasive and and I would be honored if you would take all of these these provisions that I brought, the value of which is far greater than the wool that you were seeking earlier from my husband. This speech between Abigail and David, this conversation, it's the longest conversation that David has with anyone in, in all of recorded scripture. She skillfully reminds David of his destiny. David, you're meant to be king one day. You have been anointed to be king one day. And she deftly points him toward his ideals to to live up uh, to the anointing that he has received. David, I know that your calling and your destiny, it's been temporarily hijacked by rage and frustration. I get it. I live with the guy. Okay, but slaughtering him and all of the males in this family, it goes against your deepest ideals. I mean, you're meant for more than this. You're meant for a future more noble than that of a cold-blooded avenger of wounded pride. I mean, Abishail, Abishail, Abigail, Abishail, Abigail's emotional quotient, it's off the charts. She has an instinctual grasp of David's most deeply held values, and of his destiny. And it's her poise and her courage and her winsomeness. It all has its desired effect. David's rage dissipates. His heart softens. Mr. Hyde recedes. Dr. Jekyll reemerges. And David blesses her. He blesses the courage that she's displayed under fire for discerning the long-range implications of what his rage-induced intentions would have just done a few moments later. He said, you know what? You stopped me from doing something that I would have regretted the rest of my life. So Abigail, she's been an ideal godsend to David. And she is also a godsend to preserve his ideals. I mean, what, what a great story of how God empowered Abigail to come to David and help him to hold on to his ideals that he was so close to abandoning uh, altogether. And 
Abigail is not alone in the Bible in terms of God using instruments to help his people hold on to their high ideals. This world, it's a hostile environment to high ideals. It is. And God sends instruments to help his people hold on to the ideals that he's placed within us. And these instruments that he uses, they're, they don't always possess stunning beauty in smoke and hot bods. I mean, just last week, we learned about Abram and, and the altars that he built. God promised him uh, a child uh, through his wife Sarai, even though they're in their fourth quarter. Uh, but when a famine forces Abram and Sarai to go seek food in Egypt, Abram compromises his ideals. On the way, he's telling his wife, listen, when they see you, they're going to kill me to, make, to allow them to take you. So I'm afraid for my life. Tell them you're my sister. Tell them you're my sister. And sure enough, is when they get to Egypt, Pharaoh's talent scouts are there. They spot her and they say, is she available? Well, she's my sister. Okay, she's now in Pharaoh's harem. I mean, definitely not Abram's finest moment. He's not going to get the Husband of the Year award this year. The future that God had promised to them is utterly ruined. She's in another man's harem. But God intervenes, sends a disease to break out in Pharaoh's palace, and he realizes that it all started when he took that woman into his harem, and so he does a little investigation, finds out that she is married to Abram, calls Abram in on the carpet, and, and it's the Pharaoh who reminds him of his highest ideals. You're the woman's husband, for heaven's sake. So sometimes God's reminder of our highest ideals don't come with a pretty face. It might be with a Pharaoh's finger. There are others. Take the Apostle Peter. I mean, he, he had a complete meltdown of allegiance to Christ as he denies him three times. What instrument did God use in order to remind Peter of his earlier loyalty to Christ? A rooster. It crows three times. So other times, God will use the warmth of a trusted mentor. Paul talks to Timothy. Timothy, uh, guard what has been entrusted to you. Timothy, uh, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which it's in you through the laying on of my hands. He's encouraging him to hold on to his highest ideals. Parents and grandparents, um, there are times when God will use you to point to the highest ideals of your children or your grandchildren. But in a great twist worthy of a master story crafter, there are times when God will take your grandchildren or your children and he will use them to remind you of your highest ideals that have been backburnered. You got any ideals that you held passionately in your younger days that are now a all but abandoned, crushed by this, this world, and you need an Abigail to remind you of those high ideals? I mean, who has God put in your life to remind you of your highest ideals? Who is it? Is it a mentor? Is it a pharaoh? Is it a rooster? Is it an Abigail? Who has God put in your life to remind you of your God-ordained destiny that you really believed firmly in your younger years? Who has God put in your life to remind you that you're meant for more? You're meant for more. David, you're meant for more than just being a pistol-packing warlord that's going to slaughter people indiscriminately. You're meant for more than that. Abram, you're meant for more than languishing the remainder of your life knowing that your wife is in someone's harem because of your inability to hold high ideals. Peter, you're meant for more. You're meant for more than just denying the Lord Jesus Christ. You're meant for higher 
Timothy, you're meant for more than being just a timid, squeamish little pastor who's afraid to just stand on the truth of the gospel that you've been given. Who has God put in your life to remind you that you're meant for more? And just as a final challenge, are you the Abigail that someone else needs to remind someone else of the high ideals that God has placed within them? It's a great story. God says, okay, it's not just thousands of years old. Guess what? It can be contemporary as you become Abigail to a David today. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, we live in a world that is rough on high ideals. Its environment, the environment in which we live, it's very difficult to maintain ideals that were given to us and established uh, in us some time ago. And so we'll acknowledge, Lord Jesus, the need that we have for people like Abigail, people that we have need of, like Pharaoh, even, even someone who does not believe in you, you can use to point us to our highest ideals. You, can, you, you place in our lives those who are like Paul and even like the, the rooster who reminds us of a loyalty that we've had to Jesus Christ and held firmly to and was so willing to sacrifice uh, in days before, but now all of that seems to be, have been changed. And so, Lord Jesus, that we might live life uh, as, a, as an individual who is living from the highest ideals that you've given to us, we again embrace your Holy Spirit asking that you would have us be fully open to the voice of those who will be an Abigail in our lives. And Lord, when we hear your whisper, as we see in the life of another person whom we love and we care for, that they're not living up to their high ideals, God, help us to be the Abigail to them, that your kingdom might come and glory be done here on earth, even if it's done in heaven. And this is a prayer that we make in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen.